The bloop was recorded on hydrophones in the Pacific in 1997. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration detected a loud, ultra-low frequency sound at underwater listening sites more than 5,000 kilometers apart. It was among several unexplained noises. Several publications had published in the years that followed popularized the hypothesis that the bloop may have been the organic sound of an undiscovered species, elevating the bloop to the status of a significant unsolved enigma. But the NOAA is confident that it was not an animal, but rather the sound of a reasonably typical occurrence, an Antarctic ice shelf breaking apart. In fact, Wired.co.uk actually contacted the NOAA and Oregon State University seismologist Robert Ziak via email to confirm the validity of the claims. He verified that the bloop was, in fact, nothing more than an ice quake, confirming what they had long suspected. The claim that a giant monster made noises that could be heard all over the Pacific Ocean was more fiction than reality. Robert had detailed the results to us and verified that the frequency and time duration properties of the bloop signal are compatible with and nearly identical to ice quake signals they obtained off the coast of Antarctica. He also elaborated that in 2005 marked the beginning of an acoustic survey of Bransfield Strait and the Drake Passage that lasted until 2010. Analysis of these recent acoustic data reveal that the significant source of natural sound in the southern seas is the sounds of ice breaking up and cracking. Each year, tens of thousands of ice quakes are actually generated by the fracturing and thawing sea ice and ice caving from glaciers into the ocean. These signals are very similar to the bloop. All this makes it very improbable that the sound is actually animal-related. Still, he noted that the theory that an animal creating the bloop was never really plausible. How the bloop sound is reproduced has led to a great deal of misunderstanding about its animal origin. It is typically played at 16 times the average pace, making it seem like an animal vocalization. However, when the sound is played in real time, it has a more quake-like thunder quality. Now, according to Robert, the hydrophones don't pick up on that many mysterious sounds. Nearly all sounds can be related to significant sound categories, like geophysical, such as earthquakes, volcanoes, or submarines. Storms, waves, and wind would be weather-related. Then you have anthropogenic, like air guns or ships. Ice is another one, like sea ice or iceberg groundings. And lastly, you would have animals and living creatures. Anything else is often some form of electrical signal interference. It is obvious why the bloop was such an intriguing phenomenon. More than 95% of the deep waters are still uncharted by humans, according to the NOAA, and only a few weeks ago, a whole new species of a whale had washed up on a New Zealand shore. Only in 2004 was the first video of a colossal squid in the wild captured on film. To paraphrase Donald Rumsfeld, there is so much about the deep ocean we clearly don't understand. I'm sure you are no stranger to terrifying, large, and harrowing fish found out at sea by fishermen. Just like many of the details you describe in your accounts listed on your channel, well, I too have an interesting story about a very large of my life. I'm not really what you'd call an adrenaline junkie or even a thrill seeker. But this was something I had to cross off my bucket list at least once. Anyway, here's where things get crazy. I'm in the cage, watching these beautiful and large majestic fish swimming all around me, knowing I'm literally within 20 feet of a man-eating predator, or as Hollywood portrays them to be, there's about three of them swimming around me. And that's when I noticed their sudden disinterest of swimming around me, if that makes any sense. They kind of start to trail off towards the other direction out into the open sea. And as I begin to sit there, confused, wondering why they're no longer swimming there, they acted spooked. And that's when I begin to see that the deep below me, underneath me, a very, 
very large shape is beginning to emerge closer to the surface. Now, at first, I thought this might be a whale, but this shape, whatever it was, never fully surfaced enough that I could really make out the vivid details. All I could really tell you is that it was a very, very large, dark shadow of something. It seemed to be moving. Maybe it was a craft of some kind or a submarine, but it's hard to say, but it looked very, very long. Like if you were to take a sperm whale and enlarge it even more. I'm terrible at describing things, so excuse me, but the best way I can describe it is it was much larger than any marine animal or fish than I've ever seen. Much, much larger than any great white that I can ever imagine. But again, I can't give you great details. It never fully surfaced enough, even in the water, that I could make out what it was. What I can only assume looking back on the event is that this thing approaching made the great white sharks flee. Now you tell me, what's out there in the ocean besides a submarine that the sheer presence makes the fish, like great white sharks, even flee? That's something left for another day of mystery. Now, sure, you can run the whole theory of a submarine, but like I explained, it was so much more girthier and larger and longer than any submarine I've ever seen. And I'm not kidding when I say the shape of this thing was massive. It engulfed the entirety of the underneath of my cage. It was just this black mass. I couldn't really tell what it was, but it seemed to go in front of me, below me, and behind me for mainly only a minute or two before submerging back down to the depths to where I could not see it anymore. After that, these sharks had stayed gone, and once I was pulled back up to the boat, I did not tell them what happened. I only mentioned how these sharks just seemed to lose interest. It didn't really scare me as much as it makes me think about all the mysteries the ocean holds. What do you think? Recent scientific findings indicate that a storm had wiped out Khan's northern fleet before entering the Japanese seas. The invasion was concentrated on Kyushu, the most southern of Japan's major islands and the western border of the Dragon's Triangle, Devil's Triangle, or Devil's Sea. The region extends from the island of Miyake in the Japan to the Bonin Islands in the south-southeast. Taiwan and Miyake comprise the western section of the Devil's Sea. A significant portion of the triangle includes the Philippine Sea south of Japan. Countless people connect the Devil's Sea to the Bermuda Triangle regarding weird happenings. The typhoon that destroyed Khan's fleet presumably originated in the Philippine Sea. The destruction of the Khan's fleet is a Japanese legend today. If Khan had been victorious, Japan would be a different country. The Dragon's Triangle mythology lingered until the 19th century. In the Devil's Sea, sailors allegedly spotted a woman sailing a ship that resembled a traditional Japanese vessel for burning incense. No one discovered the ship's origin or why it plagued sailors for years. In 1944, a Japanese pilot had a peculiar encounter during intense combat with American forces. Toshiaki Lang claims to have spotted a monstrous sea creature during an aircraft fight over the Devil's Sea. According to him, the serpent-like beast moved swiftly through the water with its head lifted high. The serpent's enormous triangular wings helped it navigate the turbulent seas. Supposedly, the beast was roughly 150 feet in length. Without further witnesses, Lang's account seems fantastical. The Japanese then dispatched a warship into the Dragon's Triangle in 1952 to investigate ship disappearances near the Bonin Islands, commonly known as the Ogasawara Islands. They create the Triangle's southeast point. Japan's hydrographic office deployed the Kaiyomaru No. 5 with a crew of 31 to inspect the area surrounding the islands. On September 24, 1952, the ship sunk with all personnel gone. Initially, experts did not explain the ship's abrupt disappearance. The Devil's Sea tale continues to gain credence. The Japanese government closed the region to maritime trade, 
and scientists discovered that an undersea volcano had erupted as the research vessel approached the spot. The water grew too warm, lost its buoyancy, and the ship immediately sunk. The crew had no opportunity to flee. Following the shipwreck, the region remained off-limits to shipping for decades. While many traditions related to this body of water have scientific answers, there is some truth to the mythology of the Devil Sea. The invasion of Khan had coincided with the entry of a storm into the Japanese seas. The event occurred in 1281, long before satellite photography or modern aircraft might detect an approaching hurricane. In 1952, Volcanologists did not comprehend how an underwater volcano could instantaneously sink ships. In 1989, book Charles Berlitz stated that between 1952 and 1954, as many as 700 individuals had perished in the Devil's Sea. In 1995, the author Larry Cush had contradicted Berlitz by stating that deep sea fishing is a dangerous occupation. The weather, undersea volcanoes, and a lack of vigilance at sea can all result in death. The Devil Sea is, in fact, part of an active area on the planet. This region encounters several meteorological and tectonic events. Chinese stories dating back to 1000 BC assert that a gigantic dragon resides in the region. However, this part of the Pacific is a hazardous sea passage is coincidental. Modern ships, weather forecasting, and tectonic force monitoring can make the region considerably safer for air and marine travel. Even though this is a collection of unsubstantiated claims told by people who have had no reasonable explanation for what they witnessed, the sheer volume of high strangeness witnessed out at sea could be seen as alarming. And a man by the name of Dante had experienced something he could not explain in the summer of 2019 in Louisiana. I feel foolish for saying this, but I think I saw something that might have been out of place, whatever that means. I was at my grandfather's lake house in the woodland area of Louisiana last summer. This is when I had an encounter with some kind of creature, or I guess you would call it a lake creature. I know that sounds crazy, like some sort of Hollywood movie plot, but... I promise you, the truth is stranger than fiction. I couldn't fully understand or describe what it was, and I'm hoping somebody can help me identify what it might be. After doing some researching, I found your channel and saw you've done multiple videos about lake and sea monsters. Maybe one of your audience members might be able to help me in getting a resolution to what I'm about to explain. My dad and I go fishing a few times during the summer every year at the lake where my grandfather's house is situated. This particular year was no different. It was just like any other trip this time. We got our gear together, did our traditional cola pop chug, which is downing a can of soda in one big gulp, and rode out into the lake. Normally, I will row around till my father is satisfied that we have found the right spot. My father is a much more experienced fisherman than I. He lets me go first hooking my bait onto the hook and casting it into the water. I set and wait. When father cast his pole, he got a bite almost immediately. He pulled out a little three-inch trout, which would explain how he caught it so fast. You see, baby or adolescent fish aren't smart enough to stay away from your bait. Even though they know what it is, they're easier to catch. We did not take our phones out on the boat, so I can't accurately judge what time it was other than by looking up at the sun and guessing its location. I would say maybe no more than 45 minutes went by after he caught this little fish that I myself finally had a bite. It was definitely a fighter. After a lot of persistent pulling and leading, I finally began reeling it in, and just as I was about to take it out of the water, a larger fish grabbed it from me, hook and all, and took it away. I rehooked my line and threw it back into the water. I don't know why, but larger fish always love taking my smaller ones. Luckily, I had another bite a little while later. I was determined to not let this one get away from me. 
I let it lead around for a little while before starting to reel it in hard, and I waited long enough to see if it caught the fish off guard. Then, yanking hard, I began to reel it in, and as I was lifting it out of the water, I saw yet another fish trying to snag it from me. I yanked it out of the water quickly, but that did not stop the other fish from jumping out of the water to bite it and as I pulled away. It wasn't much larger than the fish I had already pulled out of the water. It definitely appeared as a more predatory fish. When it landed back in the water, oddly enough, it stared at me for a minute or two before going underneath. It was a pale blue fish with weird yellow and brown eyes. It didn't appear to have scales, but almost looked like it had skin. Thinking about it, I'm not quite sure it was even a fish at all. Its head resembled a fish, but it did not look like a fish I had ever seen before. I told my father that I had to use the restroom. I rode back to shore and thought to myself, I'm done for the day. I didn't tell my dad what I had seen, but I think the lake and the heat were messing with my head. It was pretty hot out. I think I just needed to lie down to get rid of this ominous headache that was plaguing me. So we went out again the next day. I chose a different spot in the lake for us, just in case whatever I saw yesterday still happened to be there. It took a while for either of us to get bites on our lines, and whatever happened to the fish must have happened overnight. I told my father that we must have caught all the fish yesterday, jokingly, that the lake was now up and dry for the summer. He laughs at me and said we should find another spot because after being here for hours on end, we weren't finding anything. He considered it bad luck. So I rode over to the spot near the edge of the lake on the farther side and to face the woodlands. Not much activity was happening until my father got a fish. I don't know what he caught, but it was very large. He was losing his grip of the pole. When I helped him hold onto the pole and the fish came out of the water, it must have been a 16-inch fish. Something like that wasn't enormous, but what did surprise me is this, the gigantic bite that was taken out of the side of it. The reason it was so hard to reel in and felt so heavy was because we were fighting with something that was already eating it. We looked around at this water and could see those faint glowing yellow-brown eyes, and I realized it was the same thing from the other day. Now, my dad gets kind of spooked after that, and he decided to call it a day. We rode back to shore. We had to go to the store to buy something for dinner since we hadn't really caught any fish that day, except the half-eaten one that we pulled out of the lake. Dad said he wasn't getting as much excitement out of this year's fishing, and I told him if tomorrow didn't go any better, then I would be okay with heading home early. The following morning, I wake up early, went out to the lake to sit on the docks, I watched the water as the sun rose. I couldn't see any fish in the water from where I was. Normally, when you come out there that early, it looks like the entire lake moves as fish are swimming, creating an orchestra of colors. But not today, though. The lake full of fish was still as if the fish were all gone. I looked across the water to the spot where we struggled to catch the fish yesterday, and I saw a fawn coming out of the woods towards the edge of the water. I watched as it stumbled across the ground and dipped its head to the water to drink. It was so peaceful, until something long and pale comes out of the water, biting onto its neck, pulling it down into the water itself. I stood up, frantically looking around to see if the fawn got out of the water, but after ten minutes, I could only assume what had happened. I sighed, going back inside and I walked into the kitchen to find my father drinking his coffee. I didn't tell him what I saw happen to the fawn. I did tell him about the stillness of the lake and that there were no fish. There wasn't any reason for staying for another day of fishing. He was disappointed, and he knew I was right. When we had packed up all of our stuff and loaded it onto the truck, I turned to look back at the lake one last time. We both heard some swishing around, like something heavy under the dock. And that's when we both saw the body, or should I say half-eaten body, of the fawn from earlier, just bobbing there, underneath the docks. There really wasn't much left of it, other than a massive heap of torn-up eaten flesh, and maybe a leg or two. 
It was the only real way we could even discern it was still a fawn at some point or another. It's safe to say that me and my father did not go out fishing at that lake anymore. Between the Philippines and Guam in the Pacific Ocean lies the Marianas Trench, also known more commonly as the deepest point in the ocean. At a depth of around 35,000 plus feet below sea level, the Challenger Deep is the deepest known location on Earth. Consider the Titanic, which was discovered roughly two and a half miles below the surface of the Atlantic Ocean, 12,600 feet below the surface. The Challenger Deep is almost three times deeper. Only three individuals have ever reached the Challenger Deep. The first two accomplished this feat 59 years ago. Navy Lieutenant Don Walsh, a submariner, and Jacques Pickard, an adventurer. Walsh's technical experience had enabled him to serve as a test pilot for the Trest, a Navy-purchased deep-diving research submarine. The rig was outfitted with 5-inch thick steel walls to endure enormous pressures. Specifically, 8 tons of pressure per square inch, equivalent to 2,300 pounds sitting on a person's fingernail. Walsh and Pickard created history on January 23, 1960, when they completed a five-hour, nearly seven-mile journey to the world's lowest known location. What was discovered there? Walsh, who discussed his experience in an interview with the Office of Naval Research, so he elaborated this. As we reached the seabed, we could see it is rising, and we did spot a little flat fish about a foot long, like a halibut or a sole. But that one taught us quite a deal since it was a bottom-dwelling creature with two eyes on one side, and if there's one, there are more. Because they are bottom-dwelling, this indicates that there is sufficient oxygen and food at that depth. Once we landed, we could not see anything at that bottom because the sand had been churned up. It was as if someone had painted our viewport white. We spent half an hour at the bottom and the remaining time ascending. And that was the end. This may not seem like much to some, but it opened up a new world for explorers. The Navy has long been interested in ocean exploration for maritime, scientific, educational, and military objectives. In 1958, it financed roughly 90% of all oceanographic endeavors in the United States alone. The expedition marked the conclusion of Project Necton a series of dives designed to evaluate the possibility of employing manned boats at extreme depths to research marine life and, among other scientific problems, how temperature, pressure, and sound interact at tremendous depths. Whether the Navy is scuba diving, gathering scientific data, studying shipwrecks, or testing autonomous underwater vehicles, this role continues to expand and has resulted in cooperation with several civilian scientists. With all this said, is it still possible that the bloop spoken about in the beginning of today's video could have possibly originated from something organic and not an ice glacier as originally thought? Is there a conspiracy to hide this? With the complete absence of exploration by scientists, could there really be a behemoth of a sea monster dwelling deep below the waters of the ocean? I'll let you guys decide that for yourselves. And if you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to go ahead and smack that like button and leave a comment down below because I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions. Also, if you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe because I release storytelling of the mysterious and supernatural just about every other day. As always, guys, I love you all. Keep an open mind, and I'll catch you all in the very next video.